Okay, everyone, welcome, welcome to our workshop here. Share my screen. All right. Okay. So today I'm here with some amazing uh, speakers and presenters here, and we're going to talk about microplastic pollution and ways we can help mitigate this issue. I'm uh, Alexandra Kelly, and I'm a part of the Youth Climate Lab, and we are funded by the Canadian Service Corps. All right, and before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that Youth Climate Lab is headquartered on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Ashinaabe territory here in so-called Ottawa. Further, Youth Climate Lab respects and affirms the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. Okay, and I'm Alexandra Kelly. I currently am pursuing my Bachelor's of Science degree at the University of Ottawa, specializing in biomedical science and environmental studies. And I'm also the YCL RAD cohort member uh, for the 2023 year. And we have our amazing presenters for the evening. So we have Sabrina, Aiden, Celeste, uh, Saeed, Claire, and Natasha. All right, I'll throw it over to you, Natasha, to get started. All right, next slide. Getting, getting my practice in. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. My name's Natasha and I'm with an organization called Mind Your Plastic. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about um, just the plastic pollution crisis here in Canada and share a bit more about what we do and how we're um, working to combat uh, plastic pollution. So uh, we are a registered Canadian charity and our mission is to solve and eliminate plastic pollution in Canada. So how we do that, because it's no easy feat, as all of you know, um, what we do is we we focus on elimination through the through reduction. So first and foremost, we want to just keep it from getting into our environment to begin with. Um, so what that looks like is uh, creating change by advocating for businesses in Canada to take impactful steps towards eliminating their plastic pollution footprint. And typically, we advocate more for reusable infrastructure versus the you know, uh, plastic straw for a bamboo straw. So those one for one swaps. Um, we also will work with uh, municipal governments. So we advocate for policy change within municipalities. Um, and then we also will provide direct action and education programming, inc including a uh, education program that is across the country um, and starting in April. And we'll have about 5,000 um, participants in it, which is really exciting for us. So um, next slide. So I am feel like I might be preaching to the choir here, and some of this may not be any surprise to you all, um, but the issue of plastic pollution is one that's incredibly pervasive. Um, plastic pollution, unfortunately, is on the rise. Um, plastic production is on the rise. So, of course, we have these stark statistics that we refer back to to amplify how big this issue is and how much change is truly required. Um, so, of course, less than 9% of plastic produced around the world is effectively recycled. Um, by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Um, and, you know, I, I'm someone I like to spend a lot of my time underwater, even though it's really cold where I am in Halifax. Uh, but I've, I've actually seen that happening. I just got back from a trip somewhere really warm, and I was so devastated to see more plastic than fish where I was um, in certain spots. So it, it's it's happening. Um, well, every minute, oh, this is my office assistant, excuse me for a moment. Uh, every minute, one dumb truck of plastic enters the ocean and plastic production, burning of plastic that contributes to climate change, generating 850 million tons of greenhouse gases every single year. And, you know, we, we see it all the time when we talk to municipalities, everyone has a climate action plan. Very few of them actually involve plastics as part of that plan. Um, so it's it's not something that's often thought about. I mean, we we may think of it in that way, but it, there really needs to be a stronger connection between climate change and, and how plastic plays into that. And last but not least, plastic, of course, is impacting our wildlife and our human uh, human health, which we'll, we'll get into a bit more. Thank you for bringing it back, but you can go to the next slide. Um, so in terms of human health impacts, um, you know, the question is how are micro 
macro and nanoplastics affecting our health? The the short answer is we we don't know yet. We know it's in our bodies. Um, we know that it's getting into our bodies. You know, we we've seen the studies where plastic is in our blood, our lungs, breast milk, the human heart. So those are all really scary. But you know, again, how does it get there? And more often than not, it comes through either consumption or inhalation. Um, so what we're actually discovering is that these small particles uh, can be in different organs and may cross over. Um, and you know, of course, it's it's not meant to happen. We're not meant to have plastic in our bodies. Um, so of course, this is largely concerning. But again, as of right now, we know it's in our bodies, but we don't know how it's affecting them just yet. And I like to use the example of smoking. You know, back in the day, I don't know how old you guys are, but my parents were definitely parents who smoked in the house. And this is when you could have, you could smoke anywhere. Maybe I'm aging myself. I don't know. But when they started smoking, it was cool, right? It it, it was like the good thing to do was to smoke. Um, and then we learned, oh, wait, smoking is affecting our bodies. And then we learned with the science, it's actually really, really bad for us. I'm no, um, I can't tell the future, but I really see that happening with plastics. Um, it's something that again has been, has had its era. And I think now it's time for us to start treating it like the toxic substance that it is like tobacco. So um, yeah, so with that, I'll ask for the next slide. So bringing it back to how does plastic pollution start? So we think of the linear economy. My favorite example is a Starbucks cup. I don't know, any kind of any kind of cup that we use from to-go wares, because it's just such a um, an example that's relevant for everyone. Um, so right now we currently sit in what's called a linear economy, which basically means um we have items that are um essentially made to waste. They're they're made to be used for a very, very, very short period of times. And these are incredibly problematic um, because, of course, the taking and the making requires a lot of energy and a lot of resources to get them into our hands. Um, so, again, if we use that example of an iced coffee cup or whatever it may be, um, it's gone through so much in terms of the extraction of the natural resources and then the pelletizing and then adding all these other chemical additives and then being put in more plastic to be shipped to wherever it's going to go. And then it goes through that massive life before it ends in, ends up in your hands for may, maybe an hour. And then it goes in the recycling garbage, depending on where you are, depending on the type of cup, all, all for that. And then of course, as we know with that stat of less than 10% of plastics truly being recycled, then you know where is it really going? It's very likely ending up in our environment. And as we've talked about breaking down further into um, affecting animals or even humans. Next slide, please. So the circular economy, uh, according to Mind Your Plastic, is really one of the best ways out of the plastic pollution crisis. And I, I hope you would all agree. And if you're not familiar with what the circular economy is, it really is just using waste as a resource. And, you know, the sometimes depending on the definition, recycling gets roped into this. Um, I would beg to differ that I, I don't believe that recycling would effectively be included in this, this description, um, depending on the material. How we're doing recycling now, I, I wouldn't say, but I think there's the possibility for it to be included. Um, nonetheless, essentially, it's how we can keep things in the economy, keep reusing them. We either reuse them in their original form or we repurpose them, effectively reducing the raw material extraction that's required, all the energy that goes into it, and basically, again, just keeping things minimized. Next slide, please. So one way that Mind Your Plastic is helping to eliminate plastic pollution, as I mentioned, we have our work with municipalities, we have di direct action and education programming, but one way we really feel there's a big opportunity is to work with businesses. Um, we know that businesses are really the ones who are giving us all the plastic as consumers that we really can't avoid. And, you know, barring, you know, a lot of niche shops, I don't, I know you guys are mostly all in Ontario, from what I could tell, I'm, I'm not sure where everyone else is joining in from, but where I am in Halifax, Nova Scotia, we don't have the option to go to refilleries. Um, they're they're not. It's not really common practice here. So what we really advocate for is for large scale businesses to start taking on the responsibility 
And what our toolkits do is essentially we have four different ones for different types of industries, and it provides them with a case of what are the best things that they can do to help reduce and eliminate plastic pollution in their business. And if it's not the best thing that they can do, so we go, we really shoot for the stars on the best possible thing that they could do. It's what's the great thing they can do. So it's a step down, um, maybe a bit more aspirational, but not unattainable. And then we get the, the good thing that they can do. So we really make it simple for them to really apply what they can and what's within their means. But we also frame it through the lens of, you know, we recognize that not every business wants to make the change for the environment businesses are businesses at the end of the day and they need to be profitable. So what we do with these toolkits is we show them how reuse and reduction can be profitable for them and, and, and positively affect their bottom line. Next slide, please. So of course we have lots of common problematic single use materials. We encounter them every single day and often Many of them are hidden, you know, I think one that really surprises a lot of people is like tea bags or the cups that feel like they're paper, but they're lined with plastic. Um, so these can be really, really difficult to avoid. And again, this is why as a consumer, I think it's really important to be educated and informed and inspired to make changes in our day to day. But It's also really important that we hold businesses accountable and we support the change that we want to see by again, supporting reusable infrastructure where the, wherever possible, and even just businesses that are doing the right thing, um, instead of, again, just pushing out more plastic into the, into the environment. Next slide, please. So of course, it's always hard to avoid single use plastic. But in our opinion, again, following like the best thing that you could do, um, of course, reusable. And I'll chat about this in just a moment, but you know, Ottawa is a really great place to be when it comes to reusables um, with some exciting news coming up. But um, we really think reusable is the way to go in terms of reducing a lot of our waste, whether it's consumer garbage and bringing your own water bottle, cutlery, straws, bags, all of that good stuff, even all the way up to um, operationally, again, reusing, um, you know, we see it all the time in manufacturing and shipping, reusing pallets, reusing um, shipping crates, things Things like that. Um, but from a consumer level, we really think that this is a great way to reduce at least what we're seeing a lot of in the environment, which are consumer packaged goods. Um, so things like those coffee cups and and um, straws, we, we find a lot of in the environment from our cleanups. Next slide. So again, on that note, um, you know, in terms of being a great place to be for Ottawa, I'm not sure if all of you caught this, but um, there's some news that just came out at the beginning of the week, if I'm not mistaken. So the Circular Innovation Council is actually bringing together these players here. So Sobeys, Metro and Walmart to launch a reusable cities pilot. So in Ottawa, we're going to actually see these large players take on reusability in their grocery stores which in my opinion is much needed. Um, I hear it all the time when I talk with businesses that businesses tell us they're not willing to take the risk to invest in reusables on a large scale because consumers haven't demanded it yet, which I think is baloney. But anyways, um, this is now our chance for those of you living in Ottawa. If you can, if it's within your means, please support initiatives like these because we really need to have the, the general public blow this out of the water to show that this is the change that we need to see. Because really, a lot of this stuff, it's not that complicated, but it's systemic. So that does add an extra layer of complexity. Um, but the concepts in terms of reusables, going in and filling up your stuff, having your own cute glass jars, it'll be way more aesthetic, let's be honest. And it's going to save us all money in the long run. So um, support it when you can, as well as just supporting circular initiatives, um, again, within your means. Next slide. So good alternatives to single use plastic. Um, so of course, when it's not possible to reuse, because of course we recognize that, you know, if you're going out for going out shopping, you maybe don't want to carry everything with you, like your water bottle and your coffee cup and all that good stuff. Um, but of course, try to look for items that are either recyclable and highly recyclable. So um, you know, again, that's that's a bit nuanced because we know that that recycling rate is often low. Um, but Paper alternatives are often really good alternatives too. Um, but again, it's it's 
it's all moderation. Um, so again, looking at it from the six R's, uh, if you're familiar with them. So rethinking plastic, um, asking yourself, do I really, really need this? And if the answer is yes, then looking at what the what the options are in front of you. Um, so again, using paper um, or highly recycled materials being clear PET um, would be the most highly recycled plastic. Um, again, if you, if you have no other choice but to buy it. Um, but I like to use the example of if I'm at a grocery store and I see peanut butter in a glass jar or I see peanut butter in a plastic jar, I'm probably going to buy the glass one at the very least because at least I can reuse that glass all the time versus that that plastic one. Um, but if I'm going to look at a, um, a peanut butter jar that's clear plastic or green plastic, it's best to buy that clear clear one if you can because that green one isn't as desirable to end markets and those are the ones that often end up in the garbage. Next slide, please. Alternatives to avoid. Um, so of course we we have a lot of greenwashing um, and it's really, really difficult to be a consumer right now. Um, one that really stands out would be anything that's labeled compostable um, that looks like a plastic, but is labeled compostable. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we've done a lot of research on this. They are not truly compostable um, in any Canadian municipalities um, waste management system. They do require specific presences uh, of enzymes and temperatures to effectively be broken down, which are, again, to the best of my knowledge, not available if you have composting um, in, in Ontario. I'm not sure if you have curbside collection there, but I know here in Halifax we do. And these are an absolute no-no because they also contaminate the waste stream. Um, so of course, non-banned items, so single-use plastic beverage bottles and caps, condiment sachets, food pouches, films, wraps, um, as well as, again, resource intensive materials that are designed to be single use. Like I've seen aluminum single use red solo cups, which I think is bananas. Um, but again, great if you're planning on reusing them, um, but not just to chuck in the garbage after. Next slide. So why is reusable best? Um, again, so we have fewer things entering our environment as pollution. Businesses can actually save money if they're purchasing long lasting items. So you have that initial investment up front, but it ends up being cheaper in the long run. Um, and consumers don't need to pay for that single use packaging either. Um, and then of course, cities and towns spend less on collecting waste. There's less in the landfills. Um, there's more transparency as well as we also just feel better that as humans, we're not contributing to the problem as much anymore. Next slide. So next steps, of course, so taking the steps to look at plastic pollution, um, as well as your contribution to that. I like to say, take this with a grain of salt. Can it, it can really be a downward spiral once you start looking into it. Um, but again, one thing at a time, don't feel like you need to get rid of everything and then buy all sustainable things to, cause that's again, the aesthetic, um, use what you have. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, and then of course, I, I like to think if, you know, everyone who tells me that their solution to the plastic pollution crisis is recycling, I hear that a lot. If every one of those people, you know, maybe instead of recycling, but also maybe in addition, um, wrote to their local leader or to a business that day that they went to that wouldn't accept their personal cup, I think a lot of change could happen when we look at strength in numbers. Um, and again, supporting organizations doing the important work. Next slide. Okay, good. I was trying to make sure I was fitting that into 10 minutes. I don't think I did it, but thank you all so much for listening. And uh, yeah, looking forward to any questions you may have. Hi, everyone. Um, Alex, just quickly, are we going to run through the presentations first and then do questions afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much, Natasha. That was awesome. a really good presentation. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Celeste DiGiovanni, and I am the creator of H2 Ottawa. Uh, this was actually the topic of my master's thesis back in, I'm dating myself too here, uh, 2015, I believe is when I started, and 2018 was the launch date. Um, I always like to give a little background as to kind of like how I got here. Um, I find that so much of the things that we do are so connected to the people that we are. 
and um the the um sorry one of my friends is saying hi <laughs> and the um the projects that we choose to pursue just end up being really closely connected to sorry who we are and who we who we become so when I first started H2 Ottawa, I actually knew nothing about environmentalism. I came from a, sex, a sexual diversity background, specializing in sex and gender and sociology. And when I came to the University of Ottawa, I wanted to stay in sociology, but shift my focus a bit. And I met a supervisor who I ended up really getting along with, and that's how I ended up in environmental studies. And when I first uh, stepped into my qualitative methods master's class, they were asking us to run interviews and knowing nothing about the environment, I didn't really know what I wanted to look at, but I did notice that the University of Ottawa had banned the sale of single use plastic bottles back in 2010 and wanted to work with that kind of an idea. So thus begins our journey. Next slide, please. So when I found out about the ban of water, on, water bottles on campus, I was like, what is that all about? So just a little bit of background to save myself a little bit, kind of. Um, the University of Ottawa was one of the first universities in Canada to ban the sale of single-use uh, single water bottles in 2010. I think we were beat out by a university by like a week. So this was like pretty new when I, uh, when I went into the university. And when I noticed that they didn't sell this product anymore, I as a consumer felt like I was being cheated you know I was like well why can't I have portable water on campus kind of not thinking about the environmental ramifications once again so I found the office of campus sustainability run by Jonathan Riseo and his team and I asked them I was like you know why did you why did you do this why did you support the student who did this and they said that there were a couple of reasons around it the biggest one for the university kind of echoing what Natasha was saying was as a business the university wasn't um, making enough money off of single use water bottles to um, pay for all of the waste that was being generated by the single use water bottles. So there was a little bit of that. And um, there was a lot of people just kind of not complaining about it. So when people started complaining and students started to make this movement towards um, banning single use, the university got on board. And the whole, the, um, argument that the students used was that we weren't supporting water as a human right. Uh, we were basically killing the turtles in the oceans because we were selling single use water bottles. So the university kind of wanted to get away from all of that stuff and, and put their best foot forward uh, for a few different reasons. And they settled on this ban. Next slide, please. So what did the ban do for the University of Ottawa? What ended up happening is the university had to step up and they had to make sure that all of their water fountains and kind of uh, potable water distribution uh, vehicles, so whatever that is, if that's like getting it through the water fountain, getting it through the tap, all of them had to be adjusted so that the water was the right temperature and it was coming out at the right speed and all of that kind of stuff. So they ended up investing about $200,000 into um, water on campus, water delivery and things like that on campus. So that's what the second bullet point there says. The Office of Campus Sustainability established a standard for accessible water fountains in every building on every floor of campus. Um, and then the renewal also happened then, but were students actually buying less single-use water bottles? Next slide, please. The answer is not really. So what students were doing, very similar to how I was feeling back in 2015, is they really liked the environmental protection reasons behind supporting the single use ban on water bottles. But as we can see from this RBC 2017 water attitude study, they also um, really liked the convenience and portability that single use plastics brought with them. And as you can see, those two points on the graph are pretty neck and neck. So as much as people wanna do the right thing, they feel like they also want to be convenienced throughout their day as well. So when we were confronted with this data, I was like, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of what I'm hearing from students that I'm talking to. It's kind of what I'm hearing from the U Ottawa community. Because remember, universities are just smaller micro societies of the greater whole. So we generally see the same trends. And it was exactly this. Next slide, please. So what I did 
is I worked alongside the Office of Campus Sustainability to create an alternative that suited the people who wanted to protect the environment from single-use plastics, but also wanted the convenience of portable water on campus. I'm pronouncing that because portable and potable are different things. Potable, for those who don't know, just means that the water is good to drink. Portable is that you can carry it around, just to clear that up. Um, so I wanted to make sure that students and the U Ottawa community more generally had both of those things. So we introduced H2 Ottawa. The whole premise behind the project was that this bottle could be found in the same places you would expect to find single use water bottles across campus. So you see it here in a vending machine. It was also sold at the PIVIC for those of you who go to U Ottawa. It's a little convenience store run by the student union. Um, and it was the same price as other single use plastic bottles with Pepsi or vitamin water or soda water or whatever it was. And um, sorry, I forgot one part. So when I said students weren't necessarily buying less single use plastics, what they were doing is if they forgot their multi-use water bottle, they would buy a bottle of Coke or Pepsi or vitamin water, just like the next best thing. They would dump out the contents and they would refill it with water. So that kind of convenience piece speaks pretty loudly there. Um, next slide, please. And because this was part of my master's thesis, I tracked everything that I did with the H2 Ottawa campaign, working alongside uh, the Office of Campus Sustainability, and I turned it into a master's thesis. So I used a cost benefit analysis to explain why the, the, the business or the corporate university um, wasn't gonna be losing any money off of this campaign. They were actually gaining popularity from it because H2 Ottawa was one of the first of these campaigns to be started in, in universities. And H2 Ottawa had a little, a little bit of fame uh, it's quick 15 minutes. It was at Blues Fest. It was at City Folk. Desjardins took on the campaign as well. A few other local spots around Ottawa. And it just kind of, the purpose was to start this movement that we can think outside of the box. Sustainability is for everyone. It does not have to have a dollar sign attached to it. And it's just about kind of, like Natasha was saying, getting it into the system so that it becomes an option and people start to see it as something that can be part of their lives rather than something that's something to feel guilty about or uh, something that's not for them because they could be priced out of the market, especially when we're talking about water bottles, like swell bottles were going for $50 or something. And I think that was the alternative on campus when H2 Ottawa debuted. So it's just, uh, I guess my whole presentation fits into this, just to say that we can all do something. We could all do our part um, to get rid of single-use plastics. And I'll end it there. Thanks, Alice. So hi, everyone. That was a really great presentation to everyone who came before me. Really nicely done. <laughs> um, so for my work, I'm going to be talking about the research that I've been doing on plastic pollution in Lake Ontario and also additives coming from microplastic and how that impacts fish. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to start off by introducing myself, first of all. My name is Sabrina, and I'm currently doing my Master of Environmental Science at the University of Toronto. And it's actually a course in internship-based program. So when I talk about doing research, this is like something I'm doing in addition to my program. So I've had two uh, microplastic research positions. Over the summer, I did field work with the U of T Trash Team, which is a science-based community outreach organization that also does research. So I was collecting and characterizing floating trash and microplastics on Toronto's lakefront as part of the Fighting Floatables field research team. And I am also currently a research assistant with Dr. Chelsea Rockman at the University of Toronto. And I'm looking at additive accumulation in yellow perch tissues um, as a result of mi microplastic exposure. And I did that for my undergraduate thesis and I'm continuing that project as a research assistant these days. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll start by talking about my work with the trash team. Um, essentially, like I mentioned, I spent the summer measuring and characterizing large plastics, microplastics, and general waste from various different collection methods all across Toronto's lakefront and harbour front areas. So we had five different methods, and I'm just going to run through all of them and what we were doing from a research perspective, like for field research. 
Um, one of our big, big grand duties of the day every day was collecting garbage from these floating trash cans, in a sense, called sea bins. And essentially what they are, they have these um, catch bags that pump that or they kind of vacuum water into them. And that's all the water on the surface. So that ends up trapping all the floating plastic and microplastics and any aquatic vegetation, which we call macrophytes. And that traps it in the bag. And then we take this bag or net out and we weigh it every day. We empty the contents and we put it back in the sea bin to you know, keep on working. And then we do the same thing the next day. But every day we also pick one bin and do what we call a detailed characterization on it. So we take all the big plastic, we separate it from the vegetation, we count and characterize what this type of plastic is. And then we have just vegetation with microplastics entangled in it. Now the Siemens are really good at collecting microplastics. So that's what we're looking for. So what we have to do is separate the microplastics from the aquatic vegetation. And then we take the microplastics, as you can see in um, picture number four, we take those microplastics and then we count them, like what type of microplastic we're finding and in what amount that we're finding them in. And yeah, that's basically a summary of the sea bins. And we also have litter traps, which are honestly, they're very similar. Um, they're these nets that we put in sewage drains kind of at the beginning of where sewage would enter in like any drainage. And it prevents, um, it collects trash from getting into the main sewage system. And then we take out those bags and it's very similar to the sea bins. We're characterizing the large waste that gets trapped in there and also the microplastics using the same method. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And next we have our skimming protocol, which now we're moving into not so much microplastics, but larger plastic pollution. And it's essentially what it sounds like. We take these giant pool skimmer nets and we skim across the water um, near the shore of the lakefront. And we try to get just large pieces of plastic and, you know, we get a lot of water bottles, waste containers, just general things that you often see uh, flying around in the pollution areas. And we count and characterize what we find. So how many water bottles do we find? How many bottle caps do we find? How many cans? How many takeout containers? And we tally that up and it's done. And we throw it out, of course. <laughs> so our next method that we use is kind of new to the trash team. We just deployed them over the summer and they're called Osprey Booms. So if you see in the two pictures in the middle, there's this black kind of floating cylinder. Those are the booms. And essentially what they do is that we put them at the uh, basin of the harbor front and they trap any floating debris from getting into the rest of the lake. So it's basically this barrier that accumulates plastic on one side and then we take our skimmers and we skim the top and basically do the same uh, protocol for characterizing the waste as we did for our standard skimming protocol and then finally we have our waste sharks which are a super new method it was they were just deployed at the end of last summer so i didn't get a chance to use them but my colleagues did and it's super cool they're basically these two water drones that we have a remote control and we pilot it and we basically direct it to collect trash that we see floating around where our skimmers normally couldn't get to. And we have two so far and their names are Ebb and Flo. Uh, now moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So what did we find from all of that? We had a pretty successful season. Um, we ended up finding 109,988 pieces of small trash and 235.78 kilograms of anthropogenic debris in total. And of those small pieces of trash or microplastics, we a, a little over half of them consisted of foam particles, which are essentially microplastics that get released from like big foam that gets broken down. Like if you've ever crumpled up styrofoam, it's very similar to that pretty much. And then we also had hard fragments, which are just these undefined rigid pieces of hard plastic that don't really have any specific category. Um, and then the other uh, microplastic categories just didn't fit in with any of our big four. And then pellets are essentially these little um, 
round pieces of plastics that get melted down in manufacturing plants to create like, you know, big plastic materials. And films are your wrappers, your basically flimsy, thin uh, plastics. And then the large items that we collected from our protocols like skimming or even the big stuff that gets caught in the sea bins um, was mostly large plastic fragments. But surprisingly, we got a lot of cigarette butts. And before I joined the lab, I actually didn't know that cigarettes had plastic in them because you see them all over the ground, but they actually are a huge issue and people just toss them like it's just normal to do that on the ground. So that was a big thing that we found. Um, we also found a lot of uh, large plastic film, which is essentially, you know, like a big version of the microplastic films. And going down the list, you can see all the other things. And we're using all of this data to create a policy brief to inform um, the Toronto uh, policymakers on what we found to try and help uh, create upstream solutions for plastic pollution. And next slide. And in addition to my field research, I've also been doing a lot of research with the Rockman Lab at U of T. And this was all in a lab. And as I mentioned, it was my undergraduate thesis. And now I'm continuing on to it. So my project focuses on microplastic additives. Now, what are additives? Essentially, they're these chemical compounds that get um, added to plastic materials to provide certain enhancements. So it could be anything like heat proofing, pigmentation, really anything that a normal plastic material wouldn't have. So someone would want to provide it with some kind of desired enhancement. Now, going back to the problem of microplastics, these additives, they're not really chemically bound to the monomers of the main plastic. So essentially that means that they, they can easily separate from the plastic. So the additives can leach out into water and into ecosystems. Now we know that fish and other organisms, they ingest microplastics, but we're not really sure what happens to the additives because we know the additives are prone to leaching, but what happens when an animal eats it? So my study goes on to look at whether additives get absorbed into the tissues of yellow perch, which were my study organisms after they consumed microplastics with additives. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So in order to do this, we had our first stage of the project, which was the mesocosm experiments. Now, essentially what we did was we took these big uh, mesh columns and stocked them with fish in the experimental lakes area, which is like this uh, research lake in northern Ontario. And there are fish in all of the mesocosms, which are these like groups, essentially, of treatments. And we treated them with either microplastics with additives, microplastics without additives, and no microplastics and no additives. So just our, our control group that didn't have anything in it. So uh, next slide, please. So if you look at the table, the microplastics that we treated them with are PET, PS, and PE. And they each had different additives associated with them. And with the additives have certain metals that we're looking for. So for example, titanium is in titanium dioxide, which is the additive that is associated with polystyrene. So in theory, if we um, look for titanium in the tissues of fish and we find it, that would mean that we found the additive in the fish tissues, which means that the additive leached out into the tissues. Now that's hypothetical, we have to actually do it. So how do we do that? We took the 33 fish from the experiment. Oh, sorry, it's still the last slide. Thank you. Um, we took 33 fish from the experimental lakes area and we prepared them and we tossed them into a microwave with some acids. And it kind of became this accumulation of fish tissues with um, just acid. And then we analyzed them through a spectroscopy method called an ICP-OES, which determines the metal concentrations inside a solution. So again, we're looking for these trace metals of interest so we can connect them back to see if the trace metals are there, then the additives are there. So what did we find? Now you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, bismuth was one of the metals that we were looking for and we just didn't find it, it wasn't detected. So little to no leaching of that additive. Um, titanium though, titanium was interesting because it was there, but it wasn't really significantly different between treatment groups. So that means that the titanium that was present 
was not really present, probably not present because of microplastics. It was probably some other source. So there probably wasn't any titanium leaching that we could see. Um, now, aluminum was where things got really interesting because aluminum concentrations were highest in the fish that were exposed to the microplastics with additives. So that means that uh, there was bioaccumulation of aluminum in the tissues. There was aluminum in the tissues, which indicates that there were additives in the tissues. So that means additives leached out into the fish tissues after they ate microplastics with additives, or it could have just been that the microplastics were leaching out the aluminum containing additive into the water and the fish were just exposed to that water. Now, that question, like which version of exposure was it, that interests me enough to keep me going in the lab now. So what I'm looking at now is seeing how the, our microplastics might leach into water and if that could have been a potential route for exposure instead. Now, what are the bigger implications of all this? I know this is all quite new and I know you're probably all wondering like, oh, how does this impact humans? All I can say right now is we really don't know because we don't know how much these concentrations might impact people um, or organisms even. So a next step would definitely be to see if the amount of aluminum present is toxic to fish, because I do know that aluminum can be toxic to animals if they're in high amounts, but we just don't know if the amount that we found is an issue yet, um, especially in the context of biomagnification where you have potential toxins and metals being higher as you go up in the food chain. So again, we're not sure. That's definitely a next step. Another next step in the grand scheme of microplastic research would be to perform a whole lake leaching experiment. So we take the entire experimental lakes area and see what happens to additives on a big ecosystem scale. So that would all be really interesting th to find out. And we do have plans to like figure out more about additive um, microplastic research in the future. But for now, and uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And for now, I just want to say thank you. And I also want to give a huge shout out to the U of T trash team and also the Rockman lab for allowing me to do all this research. And if you want to learn more about the U of T trash team, and you can even join the trash team if you're interested, you can um, find us on Google, just search up U of T trash team.ca. We're also on all the big social media platforms if you want to see what we're up to and get involved. Um, you can also feel free to email me anything. And thank you very much for your attention. All right, I think I'm up. Well, those have been good so far. Um, yeah, really, really great speakers. I'm impressed. I'm gonna try to keep this to the 10, 15 minute mark because um, I think we have another one after me and some questions too. So I might skip over some things um, that may have been repeated already and try to keep it interesting for the, the group here, but um, yeah, today I'll just, I'll cover a little bit of, of the health impacts, some new research I think would be interesting for the group and um, and maybe talk about some solutions. My name is Aiden, um, I'm based in San Francisco. I work for Plastic Pollution Coalition. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you that um, I have a deep passion for the natural world. This is Headwaters Forest in Northern California. Um, one of the last remaining old growth redwood forests, uh, less than 4% of all old growth redwoods are still around today from of course logging in the 19th, 20th, 21st centuries. Um, and I've just always been cognizant about how much waste we produce as a civilization. I've never really accepted it as normal. Um, I don't think it's a necessary byproduct of business or our daily lives you know, especially when it comes to, to plastic and material that we use most often once that lasts hundreds to thousands of years and persists for a really long time. Um, my background's in finance and business, actually. Um, I was in the wine industry for a long time. I saw how much waste went on there. And I recently received a master's in business and public administration and sustainability. And now I get to work on plastic issues every day. So I'm very fortunate. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, I work for a nonprofit called Plastic Pollution Coalition. Feel free to check out our website. We're a communications and advocacy organization. 
we collaborate with businesses, notables, science advisors. We have youth groups as well all over the world to sort of align with our mission to decrease plastic pollution in this world. Primarily focused on upstream solutions, and I can get into that at the end, um, but it sounds like the speakers and I are sort of all aligned in that, um, less on the recycling and, and, and sort of cleanup efforts and more on prevention, um, plastic reduction, um, designing out waste, focusing on circularity. So all those sort of things. Um, we're a small team. Um, and, and we're taking on an issue that an international coalition of scientists call the most pressing human health, human rights, climate, and man-made environmental crisis of our time. And I would agree with that. Next slide, please. So yeah, just a quick background. I'm sure everyone in this room sort of knows about plastic. I'll try to say some other things. Um, it's really only been around from in, in an industrial, like widespread scale since World War II. Um, since then, it's been become ubiquitous in our society. 99% of them are made from fossil fuels, so oil, gas, coal, old ancient plant matter, essentially, um, that we drill out of the ground and we suck out of the ground and we make synthetics out of it. Um, so, of course, that industry has a vested interest in plastic production. We create about 400 million metric tons of plastic waste every single year. And about half is tossed after a single use, which that blows my mind when I think about that every single time. 11 million metric tons, eight, 11. I've heard a lot of different statistics. Um, I think Natasha said a, a dump truck a minute. I've heard two, regardless of what it is, it's too much. Um, and it's deposited into our oceans and it wreaks havoc along the way. It's quite literally everywhere. So I, I heard recently that in, a, in most cars, an average of 500 pounds of plastic is in the average car. That's a new one to me. I find stuff out every day. It's in our clothes. It's in our walls. It's in our food packaging, toys, cars, you name it. So here's a house <laughs> to think about all the areas of your house that you might have plastic. There's a New York Times article came out last year. He tried to go one day without touching or using plastic and he broke that 160 times um so i encourage you to check that one out and ultimately it's in our bodies as a result of that um natasha did a good job talking about how how that gets into our bodies so i won't go into that um but in the air we breathe it's in our soil in our water that we drink um yeah and that's what scientists are calling a new era on this earth called the plasticine um which is, is, is incredible. Next slide, please. Anyone know what this bird is? Seeing some smiles. I know a lot of folks are off camera, but um, this is a Lazen albatross. This photo was taken by Chris Jordan in the island of Midway. It's undeniable that plastic has some qualities that might be desirable for many applications, such as durability, it's flexible, it's rigid, it can be lightweight, it's transparent, heat resistant, which is why it's in so many of those things that I just mentioned all around our house, in cars, in food packaging. Um, but those same qualities are the very reason why plastic is so environmentally destructive. Because it's lightweight, it floats. And because it exists in many forms, marine life mistakes it for food. So an average of 1 million seabirds die a year, including the albatross that you see on your screen from plastic pollution. Um, 100,000 marine mammals and turtles are killed by plastic pollution every single year because they think it's food. Sea turtles, it looks like a jellyfish, a plastic bag. Albatross think that these are fish and, and feed their young, and then they die of starvation, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's shocking. And you know, it's designed to be durable, which also means that it sticks around for a really long time. So the unfortunate consequence of this characteristic is that it persists in the environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and it just breaks into smaller pieces uh, that I'm sure we all know are called micro and nanoplastics, which is smaller than five millimeters. This is not biodegradation, this is pollution. Um, and it's invisible to most of us, especially in wealthier areas of the world in quote unquote developed, I don't like that term, but developed countries. Um, and it's found in the deepest parts of our ocean from the Marianas Trench to literally the top of Mount Everest. And that's because it can blow through the air and it travels through ocean currents 
in the gyres. Um, so plastic is truly transboundary and trans transgenerational in that way. Next slide, please. So we know it's a global problem um, and it's perpetuated by this industry, unfortunately. This is the petrochemical industry, this is a facility in Pennsylvania, that's over $2 billion. Um, and as the world electrifies, the fossil fuel industry recognizes that they're losing profits um, because traditionally oil and gas that's used to heat homes and power cars is now being swapped out for renewable energy. So their plan B is truly petrochemical production. Petrochemical production is the building blocks for plastics and fertilizers um, and, and other synthetics and, and things like that, that a facility like this produces in mass. Um, we like to say at Plastic Pollution Coalition that we have overflowing bathtub and the petrochemical industry is really ramping up production every single year and trying to convince all of us to use a, 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 a mop when realistically we should be turning off the tap. That is something that is, a, is widespread language in the industry right now. And they're investing billions of dollars into these facilities to make those building blocks. Some quick stats, um, global plastic production is predict projected to increase by 40% within this decade, thanks to nearly $200 billion investment in plastic manufacturing. By 2030, if production keeps ramping up, emissions from plastic production could reach 1.3 gigatons per year in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, which is the equivalent of almost 300 coal-fired power plants, the dirtiest energy producers in the entire world. Next slide, please. So here are some health impacts. Um, you know, we talked about how it migrates um, into the body, so I won't go over this. It's, it's found in blood, placentas, breast milk. It's astonishing. Um, and yet we're only scratching the surface, as Natasha said. We don't really know, and yet we all know. We have our suspicions, um, uh, but it's being proven right now. And I think the fossil fuel industry is doing a great job of trying to hide this science for a really long time, fund their own science that counters this, but they can't stop the flood of evidence that's happening. Um, a 2019 study by WWF estimated that adult humans ingest 50 grams, which is roughly a credit card's worth of plastic, every week by breathing it, by eating it, by drinking it, um, which is honestly not a, a huge surprise consider um, how, how plastic is ubiquitous in our, in our daily lives. All right, let's see what else I can go over. Um, chemicals, chemical additives and plastics are the biggest area of concern. More than 16,000 chemicals have been counted um, that are used to bind plastics and plasticizers, all sorts of things to make different characteristics and qualities of plastics. Um, and 25% of those are literally all already classified as hazardous um, for human health. Um, and yet they're extremely underregulated from a local, regional, international, national scale, um, which is why there's a global plastics treaty being negotiated at the UN right now. Um, a few of those are hormone disrupting and cancer causing phthalates, PFAS. I'm a candle maker at home. Um, I did it over COVID because I realized when you light a candle, you burn a paraffin, which is a byproduct of, of petroleum into your house and you breathe that. So now I make soy wax candles, 100% organic soy wax candles myself. I also refuse to pay $50 for a candle. Um, so there's a lot of different hobbies you can take up um, to prevent uh, uh, toxic exposure from byproducts of petroleum, which of course, plastic is the biggest one. Um, all right. Yeah, so so just an increased rate of cancer. You know, I have a lot of cousins that have cancer. Um, I get really sad when I think about it because they just have no idea. They burn plastic in their backyard. That they're, I'm from a small community in the North of Ireland. Um, and, um, they think it's normal to just burn plastic bags in their back. My little cousin, Sean, fought leukemia at 17. You know, a lot of these things won't be proven. Um, I can never prove that Sean got cancer uh, from plastic, but I have a huge suspicion. And um, so everyone needs to be communicating this to their loved ones, to their family, especially older generations that just go, oh, you environmentalists. The, the health impacts are the way that you can get through to people every time from both sides of the aisle. Um, and that is the biggest thing that we should be focusing on. Sorry, I'm emotional. Um, 
All right. So just the tip of the iceberg here when it comes to some health impacts. Um, what is on the next slide? Is there another slide about health impacts? Let's try it out. Great. So let's cite some new research. Um, this January, um, two alarming studies that you should all be aware of. Health problems linked with harmful plastic chemicals. I'm from the United States, so apologize. I know the majority of audience is from Canada, but our societies operate very similarly. Costs the US healthcare system $250 billion in increased costs in the year 2018 alone. I suspect that's a lot higher in the last couple of years. Um, according to a recent uh, study published in the Journal of the Endocrine Society. Again, harmful plastic chemicals are costing that much and it's not to the medical system, it's to us as taxpayers and people that have to pay for those medical uh, procedures, um, operations and, and getting health problems addressed. Um, another very alarming study, so I appreciate a previous speaker showing it's very interesting to see um, the comparison why people drink bottled water versus um, in filters. So a study published this month from the Columbia University um, and Rutgers found that on average 250,000 plastic particles are floating in an average liter of bottled water. Think about that. And then think about the 16,000 chemicals of concern that I just went over. When you drink a, a when you drink water from a bottled water, regardless of whether it's cold at the time, heat is the biggest factor. And most of the time, those have been shipped stolen water from small communities across the U.S. and Canada, mostly um, uh, black and brown communities, indigenous communities. They're just stealing their water. Essentially, they package them in single use plastic. They ship them all around the country. They sell it to you. They're selling you the plastic. It's just tap water. They're just selling you tap water and plastic, but it's been heated up as they transport it over time. And when it heats up, plastic can leach into that water and you are literally consuming toxic plastic chemicals that could cause cancer. So just think about that. Every time someone drinks out of a Gatorade bottle even, or a water bottle, the plastic from that is most likely leaching, or it's most likely already in, in the beverage itself. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of aluminum cans also have plastic liners. I just learned about this. So aluminum is not, um, not the safest alternative as well. So just keep that in mind. All right, so let's go to some solutions. I know I'm at time here. Um, so yeah, I just have, I think some of the bullets got a little messed up in the canvas switch, um, but let's just talk about a few of these. So yeah, we need, we need healthy, we need policies, right? We need policies, we can't do this on our own. Um, you know, we need local policies, we need reuse ordinances, we need international policies um, that address the full life cycle of plastic, not let's create more bioplastics and recycling. We need to address it from the moment it is extracted from the ground. We need to talk about fossil fuel subsidies. Why do we pay as taxpayers $80 billion a year as United States taxpayers so that fossil fuel companies can go find more wells makes absolutely no sense at all. If we reinvested that money into reuse infrastructure and built a circular economy, we could solve half of the single use plastic tomorrow, guaranteed. So we need policies that focus on source reduction and prevention and not on false solutions like advanced recycling, which is really incineration or compostable bioplastics, which um, that's interesting to hear in Canada. Not a lot of municipalities take that. I also have a, a high suspicion uh, that most of those are being thrown in, in the landfill anyways. Even if they, are, if they do make it to composting facilities to take them, it clogs up those facilities anyways, and they hate them. So compostable plastics are not the answer. Um, yeah, we need investment. We need policies um, upstream. Yeah, business practices. I work with businesses a lot to try to influence um, them to reduce plastic in their business operations, product offerings, everything they possibly can. Um, great to see you have some resources, uh, Natasha. We should touch base. Um, we need to design. We need to design out waste from the very beginning, right? So we need to create products that can be destruct, deconstructed at the end of life. So that is, it's essential. We can't create products without thinking about end of life. Every, all those teams need to be connected, and businesses need to be transparent, and they should have to. They should have to disclose what their plastic footprint is. Right now it's all voluntary, that should be involuntary um, in my perspective. And I'm sitting on a 
a CDP working group next month to discuss that. And I'm very excited about it. We need to shift societal values away from our culture of take, make waste, um, you know, away from linear thinking and more about reciprocity and circularity and keeping things, stop buying stuff um, in the first place. Can you reuse it? Can you fix it? Can you repair it? Can you share it? Can you give it to your neighbor versus buying it and throwing it in, in the landfill? Makes no sense. Um, talk about inherent rights of nature. We need to value we need to value trees. We need to value resources. We need to protect them legally as well. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the very last thing is individual behavior change, but you're not off the hook. Although we need policies and businesses to do their part first, governments to do their part, we also have to do our part and we have to put pressure on those entities as well. Observe your relationship with waste. Observe it. Notice how much trash you're creating on a daily basis. I try to do it. I try as hard as I can. I still create a bunch of trash every week. Um, it, it's it's hard, but just observe it. Just notice that. Control what you can control. If there's a replacement that you can afford, that you can do, that you can look up. Uh, is there a shop nearby you can support? You can change habits. You can influence your friends. Control what you can control. Just start there. Um, and I promise you, you'll, you'll start getting passionate about it. You know, does your party need to have 100 single-use plastic solo cups at it? No, it doesn't. Um, I wish I had this mentality when I was going through college. Um, and be an advocate. Get your friends and family and colleagues and community to adopt better habits. Um, that's, that's, that is imperative. That's essential. Just keep talking about it. Uh, next slide. And that's it. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, this is the plastic treaty that's being negotiated. The fourth session is in Ottawa. Um, so I just wanted to mention that quickly. I don't have enough time to discuss it, but look it up. Um, it's the most, it's the it's the the biggest opportunity we've ever had to address plastic from a global scale. We can royally mess it up, or we can um, do a good job by focusing on source reduction. All the things I just talked about. The next session is literally in Ottawa um, in late April. Um, next slide. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, there's my email there and my LinkedIn. Happy to uh, to to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. Um, yeah, so I guess, hi everyone. I'm Claire and Alexandra contacted me through a mutual connection and I'm really glad she did. Uh, I'll be talking about microplastic surveys that I conducted along the Ottawa River. Um, so just next slide. Yeah, so, um, oh, my pronouns are she and her, if anyone wants to know that. Um, I'm based in Euclid on Vancouver Island. So I'm out in BC and I'll try and make my presentation pretty brief because we are pretty short on time. Uh, first, I wanted to share a little bit about my own background and give everyone sort of a sense of my lived experience and to show that like someone's path is not, may not be like linear or traditional. And I believe it's more important to follow your passions and your interests. And so I took advantage of the pandemic <laughs> I took an online micro certificate that really focused on co-management of fisheries. And we really took like a deep dive into case studies of like marine protected areas and how do you incorporate like two eyed seeing approach. Um, it was really incredible. I would love to do it in person in Haida Gwaii. <laughs> uh, and then I also took ecosystem management technician at Fleming, which really I don't know, it boosted my field skills, which will be like really important um, for another project later on in this slide, but basically just a very general program looking at like you do a lecture one day and then you'd be out in the field another day doing like water sampling or tree ID to wildlife tracking. Um, and then really like where I started was um, at Algonquin College in Ottawa. <laughs> I took the environmental studies program and that's really where I figured out what direction of the environmental field interest me. And it was sort of like the ecology, but also like the innovation projects and like learning more about your environmental footprint. And just a little side comment, <laughs> it's best to contact me via Instagram if possible. Um, if not, feel free to email Alexandra for my email too. So next slide. <laughs> 
Sweet. Okay. Well, basically I took a lot of breaks, <laughs> not going to lie. Um, I completed all these programs that are similar to the Youth Climate Lab. Uh, they're funded by the Canada Service Corps. Um, and, you know, many of you might be el eligible for these programs because they really target youth that are, um, or youth, <laughs> people who are 18 to 30 years old. And it like really connected my knowledge from my like academic programs to real life and like field experiences. So the first one that I took and the most important one <laughs> Uh, is the Canadian Conservation Corps one. And that's where I had a placement at the Eucalypt Aquarium. Um, and it really just like, it introduced me to microplastics. Like, I'm, you know, I was from Ottawa. I don't know what microplastics were. Or like, there was just not a lot um, known about them. And it was, yeah, it's just an incredible, it's an incredible program. Um, the Canadian Wilderness Stewardship Program was a bit, I didn't have a micro pl or plastic focus at all, but it was just really cool to see like river ecology. Um, we took a um, a whitewater canoe trip down like the Coulange River in Quebec and the Ocean Bridge program. That's where I became really plastic obsessed. Um, so we'll just take a deeper dive on the next slide. <laughs> Sweet, okay, so yeah. So like I mentioned with the placement at the Eucalypt Aquarium, I got really involved in the microplastics and mar marine debris initiative, just learning more about the connections to microplastics, to marine species, and also like sharing and discussing things with the public, you know, just talking about, I know it was mentioned in the previous speakers, but just how, you know, microplastics really accumulate those toxins and the how it affects the food chain, which includes us, like that's you know, we should care about it because we are part of that food chain. Um, I hope, I don't know, I hope some of you can make it out here because it like the aquarium has a really interesting, like beautiful display just discussing ocean plastics. And like a lot of the local artists even use plastics in their workshops. Like even during the holidays, I went to this workshop where this one artist used like um, all this rope and like fishing gear from uh, cleanups, like obviously cleaned and sanitized, but we use them to make like holiday reefs or like displays. Um, yeah, basically, we so for these surveys, we went to like local beaches on Tofino and Eucalypt and just like, yeah, it was just really incredible. My back, like looking at that photo, my back is hurting. But yeah, next slide. <laughs> Um, so the Ocean Bridge project, or oh my God, program, um, that's where I got plastic obsessed. And like, this is when the pandemic hit, but that didn't stop me. It really like, I increased my online engagement and connecting with others and just like learning more, like coming to workshops like this and being a part of projects. Just, I really wanted to share awareness, like through uh, storytelling, through photography. Uh, I even hosted my own webinar, which also highlighted women in conservation. And this program, like we had a connection with um, a grant program. So I was able to apply and just like create my own pr uh, project. And it was with uh, World, Life, World Wildlife Foundation and Chante Genoux. And just, I really wanted to focus on awareness, education, but also like physical surveys and cleanups with a lot of youth groups like Wild Outside and Scouts Canada and just like talking about a, like affordable plastic alternatives um, with a, like for a wide variety of people, um, much like all the reusables that Natasha mentioned. Um, next slide. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Well, this one, this slide's pretty like turtle heavy. And I know Aiden, you mentioned turtles. You probably weren't thinking freshwater turtles, but so these are my two obsessions, nurdles and turtles. And um, there's a little, for those who are based in Ottawa, it's, it's sort of like in Orleans, it's an area called Petrie Island. And right now it's probably underwater a little bit, um, but it's a magical place normally. Um, and I was working as a park monitor there and it's just like a really unique 
spot because it's very sandy and has a lot of important habitat for birds and turtles. And, you know, it's um, they like to nest there because it's I don't know, it's just it's so unique. Um, so while I was monitoring for nests or turtles and, you know, taking notes, um, I noticed like a familiar site, which I was kind of surprised by. Um, so there were like microplastics all along um, the water line. Um, so next slide, please. <laughs> so with that grant, I decided to launch a project and it really helped me like purchase tools that I needed and like promote helping with promotion and like having prizes, plastic free ones. Um, and like the survey process I did isn't a secret. There are so many sources online like that anyone can do. Um, and I basically mimicked sort of what the Euclid Aquarium was doing in their process, in their surveys. So I would figure out the transects. So I would look at the sort of the water line and the water levels and where things were being washed up. And I would randomize like um, the numbers and go to those areas and sort of do surveys in those areas. So I used two sieves. Um, two different sizes. One would filter out the macro plastics and one would filter out the microplastics. And then I spent a long time like sorting through those types <laughs> and probably dropping a lot as well. But um, I sorted them into three types, into nurdles, micro plastic size pieces of plastic, and then styrofoam. And I sort of just like put all this data together and it was more like an experiment so it didn't really go anywhere I definitely have a collection of microplastics in my room in Ottawa sorry mom I see you in the participant list uh, <laughs> and even today so basically I have a jar of neurons like this is just like my obsession whenever I go to the beach I'm always collecting them okay sweet so next slide and my this is my last slide <laughs> um, but I just wanted to sort of share how I'm connected to microplastics today um, in certain jobs, like um, environmental education is important to me. And also like through creative outlets, like photographer, oh, sorry, photography. I just like to create awareness and talk about things with, you know, with the general public, even with nurdles, a lot of people are just like, oh, I thought those were rocks or <laughs> um, I'm always going to cleanups and you know, just as we learn, like macroplastics are just as, as important as microplastics. And even if it's just like a two minute or five minute beach cleanup, like along the waterway, like it, it's really important, like to know that you make a difference. And hey, like maybe grab a friend, like as in my slide there, that's my one of my good friends, Tracy. We actually, um, we share a passion for environment environmental issues and we would do like little dirty weekends and do cleanups together and just to create uh, awareness about what we found like so in that bag there is just like a bag of cigarettes unfortunately but um, they are going to a program that will they'll be recycled and um, reused into other products which is pretty cool and just like in general I just really wanted to connect with people like I'm also that annoying person at cleanups who like politely ask questions about how we can recycle things like nurdles, especially since they've accumulated toxins. Like, how do we dispose of them like while I'm collecting them in my room, basically? Um, or like, how can we reduce reuse um, plastics as well, which is like a perfect little shuffle onto our next speaker, which I'm excited for. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Claire, for like a great presentation. And thank you everybody for sharing your knowledge and your opinion and your research and your ideas all about plastic recycling. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah. Hi everyone. I'm Sayed Ibrahim. Uh and my goal through my presentation is to kind of give you guys a better understanding of like plastic, like as everybody has already talked today to why it's such a huge problem 
but uh then i'll be doubling down on, on like the oh like how what is taking place to like tackle these problems and what alternative methods exist to deal with the already existing problem uh, already existing plastics that are um in the environment next slide please um so as you've heard today in 2021 the global production of plastic nearly reached 400 million tons and only 9% of these plastics are being recycled according to the like to different researchers it is estimated there's currently over 140 million of tons of plastic accumulated in our rivers seas and oceans uh and even with the new renewed commitments to eliminate single use plastic it's estimated canadians will be using over 2 million tons of plastic annually by the year 2030 so as innovators um it's our goal to kind of find a direct method to tackle this problem next slide so our solution was to create polycycle systems. Poly is an innovative social enterprise that manufactures and sells small scale plastic recycling systems, allowing everyone to turn their community's plastic waste into brand new products. Working with industry experts, we took down, um, we took the exact technology found in massive recycling plants and shrunk it down into a scalable design that could be fit into a garage, workshop, or community center. We spent two years developing, prototyping, and testing these systems to ensure that they're accessible, user-friendly, and have a positive environmental impact. Next slide, please. Um, in Poly, our systems consist of a shredder that shreds down these waste plastic into smaller pieces, and then an injection molder that heats these pieces, melts them, like melts them down, and molds them into new products uh, using interchangeable molds. So each poly system can divert up to 280,000 um, liters of like water bottles each year, saving roughly 33,000 pounds of carbon dioxide and 11,000 pounds of oil and over 460,000 liters of water and filtration systems when plastics are like being created. Next slide, please. So we've had many examples that showcase the benefits of a poly system uh, and how it could create positive environmental impact. For example, we leased one of our poly systems to Andy from Brantford, Ontario. Andy and his company, MEA Health, uh, are using poly systems to recycle waste from the medical industry and create, um, and create brand new items. Our machines have also been used to create daily household items like flower pots, and even construction tiles while diverting plastic waste from going to landfills, oceans, and rivers. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip over the next few slides because I'm sure you already know what are some what the plastics are and how much you know about them. But in short, as you're aware, plastics are made of organic uh, polymers. Each of them have different characteristics such as electric conductivity, transparency, top them that makes them useful. So in so many cases, uh, and like Aiden says, we 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 have we said we have them so everywhere around us. Um, plastics are usually classified by their chemical structure and polymers backbone and like side chains. Um, and they're and they're like the important groups of plastics are the seven types that you usually see on uh, plastic stamps, and as you can see on this slide. Um, next slide, please. Yes. So, so how are they made? Uh, I know we talked today about how like they're coming from coal, natural gas, and oil, but uh, yeah, but plastics are mainly carbon based. That's why they're called as organic materials. Most plastics are made from chemicals that come from oil, natural gas, or coal. To create these plastics, scientists like companies heat those chemicals that causes them to break down into molecules. Then they join these molecules into chains they call polymers, and these chains make up plastics. Different combination of molecules from different kinds of, like form different kinds of plastics. The process of creating plastics is very simple, but consumes a lot of natural resources. And after these plastics are made into large liquid batches, they get formed into pellets, and these pellets are then shipped to different factories, remelted, and created into products. Next slide, please. So as you're aware, plastics have so many positive uh, impacts on our lives. They're lightweight, which makes them great for transportation. They're inexpensive to mass produce in large amounts. For example, even our uh, medical pill bottles, um, we can have access to so many great times 
forms of pharmaceutical uh, products from international resources, just because plastics are easy to manufacture and ship them and they're very durable. Um, they're also water resistant, last long for piping, tra transporting equipment, cabling, um, <clears throat> and different sources. And they're also used to create benches, chairs. I'm sure um, I know the chair I'm sitting right now is made of plastic, even the cloth cover on it is a form of plastic cover. And so that's why plastics are so commonly used. But next, next slide, please. But as mentioned, plastics are created to last long. All of these cables we're lying down, we want to make sure they last 100 years or 200 years that we aim them. Um, the negative effects of plastics come from the plastic usage due to insufficient repurposing and recycling of these plastics. Um, due to the heavy usage of plastics and large manufacturing rate, most existing communities uh, around the world cannot recycle their own plastic waste, and therefore they will end up accumulated into different resources. These plastics are bound to stay in the environment as trash for hundreds of years. Um, currently, uh, we produce about 350 million tons of plastic annually, uh, and 30 like and which 30 million tons of them end up in the ocean, which as you heard from like the great many presenters today, uh, they lead to different resources. Next slide, please. Um, so what happens to plastics once they reach their end of the life? Um, and this is this is the problem we're trying to tackle on poly. Um, so humans make so much plastic waste, but it all has to go somewhere eventually. Plastic waste has usually three fates, um, recycling them, thermal destruction, as it was mentioned, and landfills and oceans and pretty much just laying around. Um, recycling the plastic waste doesn't usually um, like doesn't usually do much and only 9% of the plastic that we do create will get recycled. The rest of the plastic waste is either get burned to get eradicated or sent to landfills and pile up in the environment. Um, burning plastic waste, of course, is very dangerous uh, since you're dealing with heavy processes and chemical compounds and these can lead to like fuels being pushed out in the environment um, and many, many different types of chemicals causing public health risks, especially, especially in developing countries. Um, and next slide, please. And as for landfills, what we heard tonight, uh, plastic usually ends up sitting in a landfill for years and years. Um, because these products are not biodegradable, um, sunlight will usually break them down into these microplastic bits um, known as microplastics. And they can find their way into our soil harm, uh, and harm our crops, get stuck in animal digestive systems, um, and the harmful chemical can leak into the environment. Uh, like we mentioned, the fish and different animals. Um, so I'm going over these slides because I want to make sure we, with time constraint. Uh, but yes, and one of the biggest natural environmental effects are the marine life uh, and the plastic pollution in marine. Um, so microplastics often slip into landfills and accumulate in the water systems, landing uh, like leading to harm more underwater ecosystems, injuring marine life and increased pathogen growth in the oceans. Um, a fun fact, well, not fun fact. In 2016, it was estimated that about 20 million metric tons or 11% of all plastics produced uh, had entered the ecosystems and a large number of these are expected, and this number is expected to double by the year 2030. Um, next slide, please. But how do we stop plastic pollution? Um, excuse me. Um, Yes, next slide. So the best option of reducing plastic consumption is to re like reduce our plastic use. Um, as mentioned today, stopping consumption entirely is probably a very hard decision to make, but switching out of single-use plastic water bottles to reusable water bottles, um, reusable grocery bags, um, can significantly reduce the amount of plastic that we're using. Uh, and you can also choose like things like for here option while eating out, or eating on regular dishes and culture and avoid non-recycled, like avoid non-recycled plastic bottles and plastic straws and skip out on the plastic wrapper completely when you use on your daily consumption. Um, next slide, please. But since plastics are so useful and effective material in many cases, it is like infeasible to get rid of them fully. So the next best option, of course, is plastic recycling. Plastic recycling, um, 
overall, like will reduce the overall demand for plastic production and therefore stop the manufacturing pro like the manufacturing of more pro process and stop the flow of these plastics that are in existence into going to landfills or harming our environment in many different methods. Plastic recycling is the process uh, of, like I mentioned, melting these plastics down and giving them a new life, uh, allowing it to do more for our like for our community and um, and our company Poly is an example of how companies or groups can actually use plastic waste to create brand new products and even make a profit out of it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide is a video of Poly. Um, since it's eight thirty already, I think. Uh, if it's okay, we're gonna go ahead and skip out on that. Um, if you can switch to the next slide. Um, yeah. So, in a very quick sum conclusion, plastic waste is a concern, and it, like, and it, the addressment for the betterment of both environment and our livelihood is very essential. Um, to tackle these issues, always remember to be mindful, uh, of the plastic waste in your life. Switch to reusable alternatives when possible, and if not. Try to reuse your plastics as much as I, you can because you're giving them a uh, new life. A, <clears throat> a positive impact of plastic material doesn't easily break, uh, excuse me. A positive fact about plastic is that it doesn't easily break down, so we can use them more and more often. Uh, and these plastics can be used in different fashions. Also make sure you to support initiatives that aim to reduce the plastic waste in our environment. Uh, initiatives like, um, H, uh, H2 Ottawa, H2O. Um, there are many communities and groups around the world that help clean up plastic and get rid of these areas um, like the University of Toronto's Trash Lab and their robot uh, recycling chart. It was really nice. Um, but you can also get as students, as early as innovators or as people who are passionate, you can also get involved in schools or in your workplace to support environmental projects. Poly started at Enactus U Ottawa, which is a student-led club that focuses on social entrepreneurship uh, and with, with focus on making a positive change around the world. Joining clubs like Enactus or teams like Poly uh, are motivating and tangible ways to help your society. Um, and of course, finally, focus on small-scale impact and things that you can do to actually better your life to change the world for a positive. Uh, small like swaps in your life and being mini like being mindful of your consumption and contributing to recycling projects can have a great impact overall in all of our futures. And I would recommend for you to continue being mindful of your plastic consumption. I know if you're here tonight, spending your Thursday night until 8 p.m. listening to these talks, that means you're on a right path. So please continue um, being passionate about this and being passionate about our environment. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for everything you presented tonight. That was fantastic. All the information that you shared with us. And I hope all of our uh, watchers have learned something new. Let me just stop this here. And I will throw it into the group. If anyone has any questions, uh, I think you can come off. Yeah, thank you to all our speakers. I saw we had one question in the chat um, about what's the number one thing you believe that the government should do to tackle the overabundance of plastics in the environment? Uh, I know Celeste responded about banning single use plastics. Um, I don't know if any of our other speakers have any quick answers or things about one thing that um, governments could be doing. Hold businesses accountable. I think that's something we see again. One of the things we really focus on is mind your plastic is, you know, I think we all individually have a role to play here, but more often than not, the consumers are the ones who are shamed for not bringing their straw. Um, and that's just simply, that's, that's just not it, you know? Um, so I, I really love what the, the Canadian federal government has been doing. 
um, up until recently in terms of funding reuse projects to see how these are going to work. Because again, it's uh, just to Celeste's point, it's it's not really the one for one swapping either. Um, it really truly is a systemic change that we need to invest in. And until we have the policies in place and the funding to support the transition, it's just not going to happen. So we just need to strong arm the businesses into doing it. I would agree with that. Um, I don't think that a government can seriously take steps to reduce single use plastic while they are subsidizing and funding the industry in which plastics um, are produced. If you are subsidizing fossil fuels, which are the raw input for 99% of all plastics, um, I don't think you can be taken seriously as a government that wants to reduce plastic pollution in your country. So I think we need to look at it from a systems lens and reallocate funds from fossil fuel investment, divest from fossil fuels and into regenerative uh, materials, seaweed packaging, mushrooms, um, all the things that give back to the earth and build reuse infrastructure. Awesome. And I see there's one more question from Jaden. What is the best course of action to kick off the transition in that case? Might businesses be the start? Um, if I may, um, well, actually, in my opinion, yes, businesses are like a great way to get started. Um, our goal with Poly was to not only enable communities to recycle their own plastic on a smaller scale, but also bring an awareness that majority of these big recycling plants only focus on big cities and so many communities around the world or even here in Canada, northern Canada, or even I know here about an hour north of Ottawa, there's a community that doesn't have their own recycling station. So once we do things, we take our initiatives, then we can ask the government for different sources of um, fundings or bring this awareness and kind of like make a chain effect that people are interested and we should be investing on it. I think a business or a small projects, anything is, is a wonderful way of uh, approaching this problem. If I may, I just have a quick thing that I wanted to add on that one. Um, so I do agree with the business thing. I think that there just needs to be a little bit of incentive. And in Canada, we have various levels of government. It ranges from the feds all the way down to advisory groups. Um, which are just people like you and me who choose to get involved. So every level in that link has to be doing something for real change to happen. And that's what makes change so challenging is, as you know, some of you know who work in policy or are you know, well-versed in it, I guess, is our government tends to work in silos. So they don't talk to each other. And what happens is when you have all of these different groups that have an idea of what they want to do, but they're not willing to collaborate to get it, is it becomes really fragmented and then you don't have a story to follow. So when consumers are trying to be like, which one do I pick? And thank you, um, Natasha, for the clear and, and uh, colored plastic example. It's a really good point. Um, but when the consumer doesn't have the information to go off of, the consumer doesn't know what to do. And then if you look at another systemic issue, it's the way that Canada actually organizes waste. Like every municipality basically has a budget to be able to pay for garbage removal it doesn't just kind of like poof run away it's like contractors are pulled in and they are given a job to do and what happens is the municipalities aren't given very much money for waste removal so these contractors who end up taking these positions are huge garbage truck companies that actually own like every means of production from the garbage trucks themselves to the landfills and a lot of the time what happens is our recycling is not going into a recycling plant because they found a more cost effective way to put it into a dump somewhere else. And the travel routes of these garbage trucks, like I could go on all day, and I, but I won't. There's a really good book called Canada Waste Flows. So I'll throw it in the chat for anyone who's interested. And it's a, it's a university lab. It goes over all of this stuff in Ontario. Um, but anyway, all of that to say is I think that there needs to be a drive and that drive is coming from us. Um, they're hearing us, you know, we have some things that are being implemented, but we need that system to kind of come together to collaborate on a change 
And then that would have to spark some sort of education that goes towards the consumer. And then once that is played out, once the government and the consumers are on the same page, the corporations will have no choice but to follow suit. And the government can also impose tariffs and things like that for if they choose to break the law. Um, but Canadian environmental law doesn't have teeth. We have policies instead. So anyway, there's a lot of okay, but okay, but all over the place, which is why this hasn't been solved yet. It's a bigger issue than us. But um, I really think that just getting those corporations to do their job is going to take a really strong narrative. And I think that at, for us, what we can do every day is we can just push that narrative. Like Aaron was saying, like, be the environmentalist in the room. Don't worry about what other people have to say. Get your message out there because it doesn't matter who you're talking to. Eventually, it's going to fall on good ears. And even if one person picks it up, a few things of what you're saying, then they can pass it forward. And then when we start doing things like that, I think that eventually we'll start to see some change. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Les. Uh, did anyone else have any additional questions? If not, you can throw them in the chat or you can feel free to reach out to me. I can pass on a message to any speaker you'd like. Um, Celeste, I think, is throwing the book in the chat right now. <laughs> so, well, I think this will then wrap up our webinar for this evening. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much again to our amazing presenters. They did a wonderful job. Um, and to thank everyone who attended this evening, I really hope there was a piece of information that you can take away and reflect on your day-to-day -day life, um, how it affects us, how it affects our planet as a whole, our future. Um, so thank you all so much for tonight and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, take care. Bye for now. Thank you.